Good evening. I'm Susan Grew, the Director of Programs for the Newport Beach Public Library Foundation, and I welcome you here tonight. Before we get started, a couple of the standard housekeeping items. Please, silence your cell phones. You don't have to turn them off, just put them to silence, please. We don't want to interrupt what these doctors have to tell us tonight. Um, and also another thing, especially that's unique really to this program, it is so hard to hold your questions to the end because everything that these doctors are talking about, you want to know more about, and you may have some um, observations, personal questions that you ask, and we, that is one of the things we always do is built in extra time, not only for audience Q&A, but also time afterwards to visit with these wonderful doctors. So do hold your questions till the end. We'll wait till both presentations are over, and and then take your audience questions, and after that, allow some visit one-on-one -on -one time up here at the front with the doctors. Um, and finally, anything you don't catch here tonight information-wise, remember that the foundation does videotape all of these lectures, and they will be available for streaming through our website, usually within about two weeks following the program. Now, on to the evening. Um, again, I'm Susan Grew, the Programs Director of the Foundation, and I want to welcome you here on behalf of both the, public li the Newport Beach Public Library Foundation and our partners in this series, UCI Health. Um, if you see Tanya and Michelle came early and put um, there in the back at the UCI table, and they put these informational packets on your chairs. If anyone did not get one, please see Tanya and Michelle after the program, and they can also answer further questions about scheduling time with this wonder, these wonderful doctors and more of the, the um, fabulous uh, staff of the UCI Health Center. We at the Foundation pride ourselves on supporting this beautiful library in its mission to be the cultural, informational, and educational heart of the city of Newport Beach. This lecture series definitely fits that billing, but we absolutely cannot put series on like this without your help. We are a completely membership-supported organization. We receive no funds from the city. And we ask you to help us to continue to support this beautiful library and become a member of the foundation tonight if you are not already a member. And I do see many familiar faces here and I welcome you back and I thank you for supporting the foundation. Membership applications can be found in the back of the room inside our brand new newsletter featuring Masha Gessen on the cover. So I invite you to take a copy of the Hot Off the Presses newsletter. And inside, you can find a membership application. And you can also find our web address, where you can um, jump on and become a member online even more quickly and easily than filling out a membership application. One of the most valuable privileges of being a foundation member is the advance notice that you all get as members of our upcoming programs. I know I receive phone calls throughout this program season from people asking about tickets to our already sold out programs. If you are a member, you will, have, you will get advance notice of these programs and that will allow you to jump ahead of the ticket queue and make sure that you have your seat reserved for wonderful programs such as Pulitzer, Pul Pulitzer Prize winner Colson Whitehead and National Book Award winner Masha Gessen, as well as New, York, New Yorker writer and um, cartoonist Myra Kalman, who will be coming in a few weeks. So as members, you don't miss out on these programs. So I urge all of you to join us and make sure you save your seat for all of our programs. In addition to thanking you, the members, for the support that you give the foundation and this library, I would like to thank our Medicine in Our Backyard series sponsors, the late Dr. Ike and the late Ginny Kempler. Our community may have lost these generous and loving people, but we are so happy to have their philanthropic spirits live on in this series. And I would be remiss if I did not mention, and they don't like me to do this, but uh, if I did not mention Mike and Polly Smith, they're here tonight, and they, through their sponsorship and vision, they
they made this series go from concept to reality. So we owe a debt of gratitude for the Smiths. Thank you. This series continues through May. The next lecture will be held on April 23rd and will feature Dr. Shaw and Dr. Kadina talking about treatments for back pain. But first, I am very pleased to introduce Dr. Marjan Farid and Dr. Sumit Gar Garg to talk to you tonight about cataract surgery. We'll start with Dr. Farid. Thank you so much for inviting us here. It really is an honor and a pleasure to be here tonight with you all. And hopefully we'll get some of your questions answered. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Garg and I um, are colleagues at uh, Gavin Herbert Eye Institute. We do cataract surgery and corneal surgery. And uh, we're both happy here to be here tonight and answer all your questions. So let's talk a little bit about the background of what a cataract is and how to prepare for cataract surgery and what are the important features um, sort of to make sure are aligned before uh, signing up for cataract surgery. So we'll, we'll learn about what is a cataract, reasons for cataract formation, impact in the elderly population, impact on driving, um, preoperative evaluation, which includes an assessment of dry eye disease, um, the process of cataract surgery, postoperative care, and postoperative signs of complications. So the cataract, some patients ask me, well, is it a layer that forms on the eye or a layer that forms on the lens? Cataract is really the actual crystalline lens of the eye here that opacifies with age. It's a normal process of aging, and I tell patients, everybody gets gray hair, everybody's gonna get a cataract. So it's a matter of when that opacification becomes visually significant is when we actually then talk about cataract surgery. And I'll tell you, with today's technology and the advancements of today's technology, in this country anyways, we don't wait until the cataract becomes so severe that you can't see because we're good at taking these out earlier and, and the technology is so, so much improved. Um, some of the early signs of cataract formation. So some of the earliest signs I hear from patient uh, are glare at night, especially when driving, because the cataract and the opacification of the lens cause a scattering of the light. Uh, poor focusing, needing more light to read is another uh, big indication that the cataract is starting to advance. Um, risk factors, usually it's age, um, but exposure to UV light, diabetic patients tend to get cataract a little bit earlier. Um, trauma, or if uh, patients have been on medications such as steroids for other diseases, steroids will cause advancement of cataracts, or, uh, cataracts as well. So depending on where the opacification is in the lens, we sometimes call it either a posterior cataract or a nuclear cataract or a cortical cataract. And these just refer to where the area of opacity is on the lens. But so there's different forms and all of them can essentially lead to the same symptoms. And we talked about this contrast sensitivity is another big uh, aspect of cataract formation. And this is what causes a lot of issues, especially with night and seeing well in the dark. Um, usually, uh, patients will say, well, if I change my glasses, will that help? To some, to some degree, it will when the cataract is in the early stages. But at some point, when the cataract is significant, changing the prescription doesn't help, usually. And some patients will see what we call a myopic shift as the cataract gets thicker, that the vision actually becomes more nearsighted. And this is sort of the fattening of the lens, uh, and uh, that, that gives it more power. So your reading vision, some patients call that second sight, sometimes improve before the cataract gets worse. Um, all right, so we're seeing more and more of this as cataract surgeons. We're becoming busier and busier as we're seeing um, a greater number of the aging population come through the clinics. Uh, one out of three uh, in the elderly over 65 have some degree of visual loss. This causes daily activities to be curtailed, loss of independent living. Um, falls and uh, mobility problems are a big issue, and social isolation and depression because often um, driving becomes difficult. Third leading cause of visual loss in the elderly in the United States. 
So public health issues, and I always talk about driving with my patients because as soon as the cataract is causing visual symptoms in a driver is the time to do cataract surgery, and, and this is uh, why. For every 100,000 miles driven, older adults have a higher crash rate than do other age groups, and the number one cause of that is vision, often related to cataract. Uh, fastest group of, a uh, growing group of drivers are the elderly and uh, more likely to suffer disabling conditions or die from a car collision. So it's really um, a, a public health hazard. And I'll tell you, most of my patients are driving right up to the time of surgery, even with uh, significantly decreased vision sometimes or significant glare. So quality of life, we all know this. Driving is often um, the you know allows us to be independent, able to go shopping on our own, and take care of our uh, needs. So when this is lost, it really can lead to um, not just safety issues but also social isolation. Um, and our goal as surgeons is to optimize vision as the soon as the symptoms of glare or night driving or night vision, excuse me, becomes worse. Uh, this is a study that was published in uh, the Journal of American Medical Association uh, in JAMA in 2002 showing that cataract surgery reduces the risk of uh, crashes, um, vehicle crashes, by 50%. So what do we need to do? How do we prepare for cataract surgery? So as doctors, we want to uh, get a good medical uh, and surgical history from our patients, uh, usually a cardiovascular examination, laboratory investigations, uh, testing is required. So we get blood testing and all of that, mainly for the anesthesiologist to make sure that uh, the patient can go through the six or seven minute procedure. So it's a light procedure, but we still require a uh, complete examination. Visual acuity, where the glasses are, uh, patients are nearsighted, farsighted, and what the goals of the patient are after surgery, and Dr. Garg will go into the details of that a little bit later. We examine the eyes. We're really looking for other comorbid conditions that can occur with cataracts, such as macular degeneration, glaucoma, dry eye disease, and sometimes these other diseases can limit the final visual outcome for patients. Or for example, in the case of dry eye disease, dry eyes can get a little worse right after cataract surgery. Usually it's temporary, but knowing it up front can really help us curtail that. We do uh, measurements on the length of the eye, the corneal curvature to determine the lens power that needs to go into the eye, and of course the biggest part is patient education and information passing. Let's talk a little bit about dry eye disease as it relates to cataract surgery. So in a recent study, um, it was shown that about 50% of patients who are signed up for cataract surgery have dry eye disease, and they don't necessarily know it. They might not have the symptoms, the classic symptoms of pain and discomfort, burning, and so on, but there is clinical signs of dry eye disease, and usually this is tear film abnormalities, irregularities in the tear film, punctate keratitis, which are dry spots on the cornea. All of these things can really uh, affect vision, and sometimes the patient comes in thinking they have cataract and actually they have significant dry eye disease. So uh, this is something that really needs to be looked at. There's different types of dry eye disease depending on whether we're not producing enough tears or whether our tears are evaporating too fast. Most of the time, it's a mix of the two. So what do we look at? We look at, uh, we usually stain the tear film. We look at how rapidly that tear film breaks up. We want to see between blinks the tear film lasts over 10 seconds. When that's less than 10 seconds, we know that the, there's evaporative dry eye disease. We look at uh, the staining on the cornea and how much little dry spots or punctate keratitis there is on the cornea. Those irregularities on the cornea will affect lens power measurements for cataract surgery. So if the cornea looks like this, this is terrible staining and rapid tear breakup time, we want to treat this before we do measurements for cataract surgery. Very, very important. Often, dry eye disease is related to lid margin disease. So the lids uh, house are meibomian glands. The meibomian glands are what produce the oils that go into the tear film. 
Those oils are essential to keep the tear film regular and smooth on the ocular surface. If these glands are clogged up or have these thickened toothpaste-like secretions coming out of them instead of a nice clear oil, this is meibomian gland disease. And these glands need to be opened up. They need to start flowing and the oils need to improve to uh, treat the dry eyes. Again, we do staining. These are some of the dry spots we see on the cornea. Um, sometimes we can see it outside with this green, what we call lysamine green stain. And uh, so we're looking for those. We can test how much uh, tears the patient produces. This is a Schirmer test. Um, uh, not done as often. We have some better uh, testing of the tear film now that gives us better assessment of that. Um, these include osmolarity testing, where we can actually see the osmolarity of the tear, because the higher the osmolarity, the worse the dry eye disease is. Um, we can image the uh, oil glands as well. So those meibomian glands, we can actually look at their structure and see how they're doing. Um, in With aging and with chronic meibomian gland dysfunction, those glands can actually atrophy. So we want to get to them and treat them before it gets to that stage. So treatments of dry eye. So what do we want to do here? This is before cataract surgery. So if I see a patient, they've got dry eye disease, I want to get that tear film improved. So uh, there's no quick fix. Often it's a little cocktail of things that we need to put together, and it's really individually based based on the type and severity of dry eye disease. So you'll hear often uh, doctors will start with artificial tears. And there's some great over-the-counter artificial tears. Um, that do the trick in mild dry eye disease. Um, and they have different viscosities. There's you know, um, a tears for mild, there's tears for moderate to severe dry eyes, and often has to do with the amount of vis viscosity or oil lipid layer in the, tear film, in the uh, artificial tear. These are good um, in early cases. Um, there are nighttime gels and ointments for patients who, whose lids might not close all the way or who wake up in the morning with eye pain. Um, I often put them on a gel or ointment. Um, so you, a lot of patients may be on this restasis cyclosporin. This um, prescription drop was FDA approved over 13 years ago, and it's a good drop. It, it treats the inflammation and dry eye disease. Um, we now have uh, a lifidograst or Zydra, which is also in this category. It's a prescription drop to improve the inflammation of dry eye disease. So sometimes we'll put patients on this on one of these, either restasis or, or a lafitograst. All right. Punctal occlusion is another treatment for dry eye disease. I usually do this much later in the treatment of dry eye disease. This is putting a little plug in the tear duct that drains the tears into the nose. I don't want to put a plug in a patient whose tears are not good quality, because then I'm keeping poor acidic tears up against the ocular surface. So I want to improve the tear quality put them maybe on an anti-inflammatory before I plug the drain. This is essentially just plugging the drain. It increases tear volume. Treating meibomian gland disease, we're finding that this is one of the most important ways of treating dry eye disease. Um, I put all my patients who have dry eye disease on warm compresses. Um, and there are several really good masks that you can get. These are, uh, you can put in the microwave, they retain the heat. And I tell patients to use them five to 10 minutes every night, every morning and night would be even better, um, to get those oil glands to continue to flow and, and to uh, melt those trapped uh, fats in the oil glands. Sometimes the lids need to be cleaned. We can sometimes get a deposition of dead cells on the lid margin that can clog those oil glands. So I'll put patients on lid wash formula, sometimes baby shampoo. And we have a new device called Lipiflow, which is great, um, which is a 12-minute in-office procedure. Let's see if I have a picture of that here. I'm going to... Ah. Here's me getting the lipoflow procedure. So this is a 12-minute procedure, and you can see we hook up both eyes. It's completely painless and 100% safe. The eyeball is completely protected, so there's no heat that goes to the eyeball, but it does go right over the oil glands on the inner surface of the lids, uppers and lowers, and there's a 12-minute massage sequence um, that, that 
accompanies the heat, and it really basically cleans out those trapped oil glands. Usually this treatment done once a year or once every other year really helps keep those oil glands flowing. I tell patients it's like going to the dentist once a year and getting a deep clean. It doesn't take the place of the warm compresses, that's like brushing your teeth. So um, the combination of both to keep those oil glands flowing is really, really uh, important. And this is what the adapter looks like. Uh, sometimes there's mites that can infest the lashes. This is a really gross picture. Here's a picture of a Demodex mite. If we're suspicious of that, sometimes we'll put patients on um, lid scrubs that uh, contain tea tree oil, um, which suffocates the mites. This is less common, but uh, we do see it sometimes in patients who have chronic lid margin disease that's not getting better with traditional treatments. All right, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit, talk a couple more things. Um, some of you, you may have heard of autologous serum drops. These are drops that we make for patients with dry eye disease. These drops are made out of the patient's own blood. So we'll send you to the lab. They draw um, several tubes of blood. These are sent over to a compounding pharmacy that spins down the red blood cells, gets rid of the red blood cells, and the serum is bottled and you get a shipment on ice of a bunch of little vials of your own serum. And you put these in the freezer, you take one vial, it lasts maybe seven to 14 days, and you use it and you toss it and you take the next one out. This has been an amazing treatment in dry eye disease. It really he helps heal those little dry spots that we see on the cornea. So I have a lot of patients on that. I'm gonna jump ahead a little bit. So now, Importance of dry eye disease in cataract surgery. Again, it, we really want a smooth ocular surface and tear film before we do measurements for cataract surgery. So that's why I wanted to segue into that. Um, back to cataract surgery, 90 uh, percent, actually probably more than that, closer to 95 or 97 percent, is done under topical anesthesia. There's no need for general anesthesia. Patients are awake. We may give some IV sedation to help take the edge off. It's usually a nicer experience for patients, but it's a painless surgery. It's really, it's really easy. Um, general anesthesia only needed for children or adults who have severe claustrophobia. Operating time, depending on the severity of the cataract, can be you know six to seven minutes, at the most maybe 20, 25 minutes, but usually uh, most are on the lower side. Do patients need to come off their blood thinners? A lot of patients ask me this. You don't, this is a bloodless surgery. So there's really no blood vessels where we operate for cataract surgery, so uh, you can continue the blood thinners. So we make a two millimeter incision through the edge of the cornea, um, and uh, we use what's called a phaco emulsification probe. It's an ultrasound energy that goes in and breaks up this cataract, chops it up, and um, we remove the surrounding cortical uh, part of the lens. And then we implant a um, in intraocular lens through that same two and a half millimeter incision. It goes into the same capsular bag that um, houses our natural lens. So it's anatomically in the same location. And Dr. Garg will go over some very cool technology on intraocular lenses um, after my talk. Here's a quick uh, shortened video. Let me see if we can run this. Okay, so we have a one millimeter incision that's made um, and we put a little bit more numbing medication into the eye. And then we follow this with, with what's called viscoelastic that keeps the eye formed and protects the cornea when we operate. It's kind of like a thick gel that goes into the eye. There it goes. So we fill that anterior chamber with that viscoelastic. And here's our two and a half millimeter incision here on this side. Okay, now the lens sits inside a capsular membrane. We need to make an opening in that capsular membrane in order to get to the center of the cataract. So this is what's called a capsularexis. This is what ophthalmology residents struggle over to learn, uh, but once it's done, it really, uh, you know, it becomes easy after some time. But um, Dr. Garg will go over some laser technology that does some of these parts for us now if, if uh, needed. But, so that's the capsulorexis. Then we use fluid waves around the lens to kind of loosen the lens from the surrounding capsule. 
And here's now the phaco emulsification probe. It goes in there. We have another little instrument to help sort of uh, chop the cataract. And here you're going to see the entire lens being chopped. There it is. Chopped into two pieces. And then we go on to chop it into even smaller pieces. And then these small pieces are then aspirated through the same tip of that ultrasound probe. There's one little chunk there, and it's brought to the center of the eye, and uh, we basically push the gas pedal down, and it, it aspirates that chunk. And so once that's done, this is fast forwarded, now the cataract is out, there's a layer of cortical material that surrounds that lens that's brought out with another uh, instrument here which just aspirates all of that. And we're taking ex you know, precaution here not to disturb the capsule, which is a very, very thin layer um, that surrounds the cataract. We really don't want to open the capsule during this part of the surgery. Um, we don't want the back part of the eye communicating with the front part. So this is all in front of the capsule surgery. We refill that capsule with the viscoelastic material, that gel that I mentioned. Here's an intraocular lens being loaded and folded and now injected through that same incision right into the capsular bag where the natural lens sits. And you can see it's got little legs on it called haptics and that helps center the lens. There's the first leg coming in. And here it's in a taco fold and it unfolds in the eye. And you can see it's made of acrylic. Most of these lenses are made of acrylic. Some are made with silicone. And uh, we basically put it into the capsular bag, center it, remove the viscoelastic there, clean up. And uh, how do we close that incision? 90% of the time, it doesn't need any stitch. This is a self-sealing incision. We hydrate a little bit, and you'll see the cornea turning white here when I hydrate. And that creates that little self-seal right at the wound. So patients will go home without a stitch there, and you're done. Easy. <laughs> All right, so I'm not going to talk about intraocular lenses. There's a lot of cool technology. Dr. Garg will touch upon all of that. Post-op regimen, real quick, I send patients home with a clear shield um, to sleep with uh, at, at bedtime for five to seven days. Um, we start patients on antibiotic drops and anti-inflammatory drops, and we continue these for about six weeks after surgery. We tell patients, minimize the heavy lifting, the head below heart bending for about a week after surgery, sometimes two. And... Um, we usually see the patient uh, the next day and in a week or two and then in a few months. The outcomes are very successful. We are very good at cataract surgery in this day and age of technology. Uh, complications are infrequent and rare, but things such as infection, which is very, very rare, uh, we watch for. Uh, pressure, intraocular pressure may transiently elevate. Um, retinal tears or detachments are extremely rare, but if that capsule is violated, that increases the risk of this, so we watch for that carefully. One very common occurrence, it's what's called a PCO, a posterior capsular opacification. Over time, that membrane that we leave and surrounds the lens can get opacified. That's the natural body's response and, and scarring of that membrane. That can sometimes mimic cataract, where you, you say, well, my vision was really ca clear after cataract surgery, now it's getting hazy, is my cataract coming back? So no, it's a PCO. And we treat that with a non-invasive YAG laser in the clinic, it takes all of about one to two minutes to do, and it's gone, and it's, uh, it never comes back. So that's a pretty common occurrence. So in uh, conclusion, cataract surgery is the most common surgery performed in the US. Uh, return to normal vision and activity are quickly achieved. We're very, very good at cataract surgery. The technology is awesome. Uh, risks are very low and really cool uh, lens and laser options now. So I'm going to turn it over to my partner, Dr. Garg, and he'll go through. And then we'll open to questions at the end. So thank you for your attention. All right. Well, uh, thank you all. Um, my name is Sam Garg. I'm also at the Gavin Herbert Eye Institute, where I'm a medical director and vice chair of the department. So I'll be talking um, a lot about 
similar things to what Dr. Fried spoke about. I'm going to apologize in advance. A lot of our slides are shared. We, we speak a lot, and uh, we often rely on each other for slides, and so uh, there will be some um, duplication here. I see some fam familiar faces in the crowd, so uh, thank you all for coming. Um, so eye anatomy, the eye works like a camera, okay? So one thing that we should realize is with cataract surgery, we have the ability to refocus the eye for basically wherever you want. If you want to read, we can make you read without glasses. If you want to see distance without glasses, we can do that. If you want to do both, we can do that. If you want one eye for distance, one eye for near, we can do that. And these are all because we're able to measure the, the eye very, very accurately with, with new technology that we have. Technology has been around for, um, a decade or so, or maybe even longer, and now it's even gotten better. Uh, we're fortunate at the university to uh, really pride ourselves on investing in the latest, greatest technology to give ourselves the opportunity to give our patients the best outcomes possible. And it all does start with you, though. As Dr. Fried mentioned, we need you to participate in this. And the way you participate is by following instructions, doing all your dry drops beforehand, making sure that your surface is as clean as possible so that we get good measurements. You know, I always like to say garbage in equals garbage out. If you don't give us something good to work with, it's hard for us to get, us to, to get you the outcome that you really want. And, and, you know, there are some limitations as to sometimes we can achieve a certain thing for other things that happen in the eye or, or other uh, issues that happen with people's health that we can't always give you what you want. But we're also very upfront about that and telling you, hey, this is the best technology for you or this is not. So it's really about customizing the lens and the surgery to you, not what's good for us, but what's good for you. So uh, when we look at refractive errors in the eye, there's nearsightedness or myopia, there's farsightedness or hyperopia, there's distortion, which is astigmatism, sort of a skew on your vision, and then there's difficulty with reading, um, which is called presbyopia. And that happens about age 40, 45, sometimes a little earlier, sometimes a little later. You sometimes see people who are nearsighted take off their glasses to read. Right? And that's very common. They're still presbyopic. They're just using their natural nearsightedness to read. But they still have that. When you, when you look through your distance part of your glasses, you have a hard time seeing small things. So cataract surgery is re rehabilitative surgery. It is probably the single greatest medical advancement that has impacted quality of life in the, in the world. I mean, there's millions and millions of cataract surgeries done in the world, and it's huge. I mean, you take patients from being recluse, not able to participate in community, not able to care for their families, to back to being productive members of society. But it's not just rehabilitative surgery. It's refractive surgery. We've taken cataract surgery and made it more like LASIK than it used to be. So it used to be, we'd be happy, we've got the lens in the eye, here's a pair of glasses, sir, uh, and, and you're on your way. Now we're able to get you to the point that you don't, maybe you don't want glasses. We can do that. Maybe you do want glasses, we can do that too. That makes our job a little easier. Uh, but you know, but it, is, it is a way that we're hitting LASIK-like outcomes with greater and greater precision in our surgery. The population is growing. Dr. Fried had a nice slide on this. It's, it's, it's actually not just growing, it's exponentially growing. As the, the baby boomers get older, as populations get older, as people live longer, and as we, as we learn more about the safety and efficacy of cataract surgery, there's more and more patients who need cataract surgery. Now, one thing that we haven't really touched on is even though the population's growing, what's not growing is the number of physicians who can do cataract surgery. So the number of people we train every year is essentially the same. So we're going to hit this this tipping point where we're not going to have enough surgeons to do the surgery. So uh, get your surgery done sooner than later. Okay. <laughs> I'm joking. Okay. So, um, you know, and, and refractive patients are different. You know, Dr. Free talked about this. We really want to focus on the shape of the eye and what's affecting the eye. You know, when we talk about astigmatism, astigmatism comes from two different places. It comes from the cornea and it comes from the lens. Well, we're taking the lens out. So we really want to isolate what's going on in the cornea and, and be able to, to look at that. We want to look at, you know, is there anything else going on in the eyes? There's something on the retinas, there's something on the optic nerve. You know, if you think about the eye, again, like a camera, it's more like a digital camera. The cornea is the front lens, the lens inside your eyes, the other lens that we take out and change, your retina is your film, and the optic nerve is the cable that takes that image to the brain. And if there's anything going on there, if there's an issue with the brain, you really, that, that impacts our decision making when it comes to individualizing your surgery. So evolution of cataract surgery. Well, you know, as 
many of you know, it used to be you had cataract surgery, you were in the hospital for a couple days. You, you, know, you were in sandbags around your head, uh, you had to look straight up at the ceiling, you went home, and you had these thick glasses when you came out. Okay? That, was, that was several decades ago. But then you know, in the late 80s, it re things really got good. We did a 12 millimeter incision. That's basically half the eye. Okay, um, we, we took out the whole lens, you know, Dr. Fried showed a beautiful, what we call capsule rexus, before we just sort of jab at the lens and try to make holes in it so that the lens would come out. Really not very elegant surgery, but effective, but not elegant. In, in 2010, we, were able, we went down to two millimeter incisions. We did that capsule rexus that Dr. Fried mentioned. Uh, we have now a, a machine to remove the cataract, an ultrasound machine. Um, we have foldable lenses, no sutures. Um, you only need drops for cataract surgery, no shield. Well, where is it today? Well, now we have incisions that are even less than a millimeter in some cases. We use a laser to break up that cataract. Instead of using just ultrasound, we have a laser to go in and pre-chop up the cataract, and that makes us use less energy. And the benefit of less energy is it's safer. It makes less damage to your cornea. Uh, and that's really important for cataract surgery because one of the major causes of corneal edema or swelling, one of the major indications for why we do corneal transplants is after cataract surgery, people's cornea is not bouncing back. And so if we can mitigate that in any way by using technologies to limit the amount of energy we have in the eye, well, that's better for you. Uh, now we have, we have uh, adjustable lenses. We have drug deliveries. There, there's places where instead of using drops, people could have a depot in the eye. Some of that is still uh, being worked out, and, and especially with insurance coverage and whatnot. But, it, but there's, there are technologies to do that. And now we have incisions in the cornea to treat astigmatism that we do with a laser. Instead of doing it with your hand, which you know some people's hands are very, very you know, stable and steady. Some people's are a little shaky. Depends on, on their uh, comfort level and what's going on with the case. But with a laser, it's perfect every time. You know, it's, it's a perfect arc every single time. This is what a cataract does to your vision. It decreases your ability to see details. It decreases your contrast. It decreases the light coming into your eye. It decreases your safety, as Dr. Free talked about. Um, so if we look at current statistics, and this is as of 2014, so not necessarily current, but relatively current, number of Americans 40 years or older who are affected by cataracts, 20, 20 and a half million. Uh, percentage of Americans over the age of 80 who have cataracts, 50%. Annual amount spent by the federal government to treat cataracts through Medicare, $3.4 billion. It's a huge amount of our expenditure for health care. So what causes a cataract? She talked about this. I won't go through that. We talked about symptoms already, public health issues, driving quality of life, you know, looking at, at, at uh, cataracts. If you look at this here, this is, you know, this is supposed to be, this, these images are, are a little bit old. I actually got these from my, my chairman, Roger Steinert. Uh, who many of you know, um, and he, he had this thing. But if you see here, this little kid here, and with a cataract, it becomes even harder to see. You know, that becomes something, safety, not only for yourself, but for others on the road. And again, then driving at night, glare and halo that we see. So surgery is indicated if it, in, if it impacts your visual impairment. It used to be that when people talked about cataract, it was you had to have a certain threshold by which the insurance company would pay for your cataract surgery. You had to be 2040 or worse, or 2050 or worse. 2040 is the threshold for driving. So they're telling you you can't drive, and then you can get cataract surgery. You know, that's not really great for current medicine. We want to be more proactive, more preventative, preventative than reactive. Now we do it when there's symptoms of, of cataract, and, and Dr. Free touched on a lot of these here. The other thing to understand is there's no current medical treatment, not infrequent, You'll, you'll get emails from patients or, or, or questions from patients say, I heard about this drop to reverse cataracts. People are working on it. It's not here yet. So I, I don't think in, in uh, you know, I'm considerably younger than some of you people here, some, some maybe not, uh, but I don't think I'll ever benefit from a drop for cataract surgery. I think that it's still probably several decades out in order to really impact. I think if that's gonna happen, it's gonna be, we're starting it in our kids and, and maybe, you know, we'll, it'll prevent the aging change with time. But um, who knows? Uh, so we talked about uh, the number of people who have, you know, cataracts. There's three million cataract surgeries done a year in the United States. And I think this is an underestimate of how many are, are actually done. This is 2014. Uh, success rate, 98%. Percentage of patients who have no severe postoperative complications, 99.5%. And it's, it's just an amazingly efficient and safe surgery. We talked about uh, what it is. So one thing is, you know, we live in Orange County. It's a beautiful place to live. We're in Newport Beach. 
things could be worse. Orange County is the Silicon Valley of ophthalmology. There has been more ophthalmic technology in Orange County than anywhere else in the world. And it started with Allergan. And we're the Gavin Herbert Institute, and we owe a debt of gratitude to Gavin Herbert, who actually started his company here. And because of that, they had all these other companies come. Uh, one of the a couple of companies that we work with, um, Abbott Medical Optics just got bought by Johnson & Johnson. Uh, Alcon, they have an office in Irvine, Bausch & Lomb uh, office in Aliso Via Hill. These are all huge companies when it comes to cataract surgery and, and technologies to make us better cataract surgeons and to deliver better outcomes. So we talked about the steps here. I won't do that. Uh, here's a, another quick video of a standard cataract surgery. Um, a little more edited, but again, you put, you put in uh, the jelly that Dr. Free talked about. You go in and you make that uh, two millimeter incision or two and a half millimeter incision. Uh, you, you make a hole in this shell. I like to talk about the cataract as being like an M&M, and we make a hole in that front shell. The thing is that shell is a few microns thick. Okay, it's exceedingly thin, and so our job as surgeons is to keep that intact. So we go in and we, we go in and we remove the chocolate from the M&M, &M, um, and uh, we leave you with the shell. I know it's very unsatisfying. You know, you want the chocolate, but we want the chocolate too, and so we take the chocolate, we leave you with the shell. Um, and as we remove the pieces of this cataract, there's, there's many different ways to remove a cataract. But one thing that's common for most cataract surgeries, you're using ultrasound to remove that cataract. And ultrasound is great, but the harder your cataract is, the more ultrasound you need. The more ultrasound you need, the more damage you have to cells on the backside of your cornea, which then can lead to swelling and delay of surgery. And sometimes that swelling does not rebound. And then, and then you get left with these little fragments of the chocolate on the, on the shell. We remove those, and then we put in the lens. So I'll leave that there. So let's talk about the lenses. The standard lens, the government issued lens, the lens that's most common is what's called a monofocal lens, single vision lens. So there's something that we look at in ophthalmology called defocus curves, okay? And defocus curves is a fancy way of looking at where does the light focus when you put light through this lens, okay? And a monofocal lens has a single peak, okay? And we can put that peak at distance, we can put it intermediate, we can put it at near. And this is assuming you have no astigmatism, okay? But you can put it distance, intermediate, near. You come in, Mrs. Jones wants to read in bed at night, and that's, her, that's what she does. She likes to read, she's on a computer, we keep her near. You know, Mr. Smith wants to play golf, and he, distance is what he wants, we can go for distance. But it's set, it's set at one point. You can, do, um, you can do one eye for distance, one eye for near, that's called monovision. We generally don't recommend monovision for people who've never tried it in contact lenses or are not naturally monovision. Some people are, are just blessed where they have one eye that's distance, one eye that's near, and by the time they come in for cataract, it's just they're seeing a little more cloudy, but they've never needed glassed, glasses, and that's because they were born that way, and, and they're lucky, and if they're, that's the way, I try to keep them in that monovision. Toric IOLs, toric means astigmatism correcting. So astigmatism is, instead of your cornea being shaped like a basketball, it's shaped like a football. It has a steep part to it and it has a flatter part to it. And that causes images to stretch. So if you look at like a point light and you have a lot of astigmatism, you'll see this light come off and this is ray off of it. And that causes blur. And so if, if you have a lot of astigmatism, that can affect your quality of vision. So as part of modern cataract surgery, our job is to try to treat that astigmatism the best way we can, and that's uh, with either incisions in the cornea or with a toric lens. So when we're young, we can see distance and we can see near when we have our glasses on, uh, and then we hit about age 40, 45, and that's called presbyopia, and that's because that lens stiffens, that the chocolate in your M&M stiffens, okay? And that makes it harder to, to bend the light and you have trouble seeing flexible focusing. So how do we fix that? Well, we have different lenses that allow us to do that. And if they've gone through different iterations. And so the multifocal lens that your neighbor had 10 years ago is not the multifocal lens we have now. Uh, there are newer and newer lenses that are on the horizon, some in Europe that are still being tested there. The newest lens we have now is what's called an extended depth of focus lens, and I'll talk a little bit about that. But what these do, they're all trying to cheat nature. And if you're the right candidate, what we can do is we can make that light, instead of hit one point, that, that monofocal point, we can make it hit two points. So now you have a distance peak and you have an intermediate peak, or you have a distance peak and you have a near peak, okay? What would be better than that, or what could be better than that? 
Well, now we have an elongated focus. So now you have distance, intermediate, and near before the vision starts breaking off. And there's different lenses to, to allow for that. And so uh, one of the things that we are both very interested in, and all, actually all of our cataract surgeons do, is, is we, we're, we're up to date on all the newest lenses. We all have our favorites uh, for what works best for us, but we, we're happy to talk to you about what's best for you given what you want out of the surgery. So let's talk about multifocal lenses. Well, um, you know, the, the early generation multifocal lenses were great. I mean, they, they were really fantastic because they, they gave people the option of having distance vision and near vision. One of the problems was the near vision was too close, okay? So you're used to reading out here, the reading was here. So people didn't like that. So then what they did was they pushed it out further and further. So now we have options. And some people, if they have short arms and they want to read close, we can give them that. Some people who are 6'9 and who have long arms and they want to read out here, we can give them that. Um, and so there's, there's, and some people want a little bit different reading in one eye versus the other, we can do that. And so it's great. If you, this, these are examples of those defocus curves where it shows the distance, intermediate, and near. And then if you look at the extended depth of focus, again, that's that sort of longer defocus curve where you don't have this drop off. You don't have this dip at intermediate. You actually keep intermediate and you get near as well. Now, I want to I want to preface this. Is there's no perfect lens, okay? Uh, I'm talking about all these fancy lenses, but really every lens has its downside and you have to sort of talk to your doctor about what that would be in your situation and if you're willing to, uh, to accept those downsides when you pick a lens. So when we, when we look at lenses, we sort of have a menu of what the different lenses can do. And depending on what you want, and if you have astigmatism or not, we have different options for you. Okay, this is, a, this is a, uh, an app from Johnson & Johnson that uh, we can look at, right? So if you look at a healthy young eye, you can see distance, you can see near, things are perfectly sharp, okay? If you have astigmatism though, and it's not treated, well now everything becomes blurry. That's not great. If you put in a monofocal lens and you don't treat the astigmatism, things will clear up, but they won't be much better uh, unless you try to address that. Now, you can address that with a pair of glasses. You can address that with a lens inside the eye. You can address that with incisions in the cornea. You can sometimes address that with LASIK afterwards if need be. But in general, if you can try to get it at the time of cataract surgery, you have a better shot at, at happier vision. Now, if you treat that astigmatism, wow, that distance vision really popped up, if this is assuming a distance goal. But still, things up close, your phone and your Mai Tai are not very clear. Okay, who doesn't want their Mai Tai to be clear? <laughs> Everyone wants their Mai Tai to be clear. At nighttime, though, with a monofocal lens, again, you have really nice distance vision, not a lot of glare and halo, uh, but your dash is a little blurry, okay? Um, and that's assuming, that's assuming you've treated the astigmatism here. So this is either with a monofocal lens with someone who doesn't have a lot of astigmatism or a toric lens set for distance treating the astigmatism. Now if you have a presbyopia correcting lens, well now look, your distance is clear and your near is clear too, okay? But at nighttime often with, with a presbyopia correcting lens, even though your distance is much better, you do end up with a little bit of halo and glare at nighttime. Can you guys all see those little glares around? around? This, is, this is a depiction. Everyone's is different. Most people, that halo and glare gets better over the first few weeks to few months after cataract surgery. The brain goes through a process where it realizes that's just noise and it neuroadapts. So you lose that glare and halo for the most part. And it's usually not all that evident during the day. But look, your dash is super clear. So we talked about um, Precautions post-operatively, uh, outcomes exceedingly high. 90% uh, of patients achieve a visual acuity of 20 or 40 or better um, right off the bat, and that's, that's huge. That's, that's almost LASIK-like outcomes. LASIK's probably 95%, but I mean, it used to be that we were at 70%, 50% of patients that got 20, 40 or better. Um, so let's talk a little bit about different technologies that we have. And one of, the, one of the coolest technologies we have is using a laser. Lasers are just cool, right? I mean, lasers for anything are cool. They, they've helped us in so many different ways. And um, actually, the earliest laser technology for ophthalmology started at UC Irvine with using a laser for LASIK flaps. And one of our professors, uh, Ron Kurtz, had a company. He made it. And now that's the gold standard for what we use in LASIK. Uh, and he then took it to cataract surgery. And now what we have is we have a laser that helps us do parts of the surgery. As good as we are with our hands, 
lasers are more precise. And so the way this works is you have a laser that you dock the patient to, so it goes and it images your eye. So it takes a very high resolution picture of your eye. And then it can make your cataract incisions for you exactly where you want to, to treat your astigmatism. It does that capsular erexis. So instead of we, us going around and, and, and peeling that M&M, it does it in less than a second. And then what it does is it goes in and it softens that cataract. So instead of taking this hard cataract that may have a lot of sort of firmness to it, it softens it up. So it takes an 80-year-old cataract and makes it like a 60-year-old cataract. It takes a 60-year-old cataract and makes it like a 40-year-old cataract. So you use a lot less energy when removing that lens, which then acts, acts, um, relates to a faster case with less energy and then a faster visual recovery in general. And then you can do what's called limbal relaxing incisions, which again are corneal incisions to treat astigmatism. So we're able to image the eye. This is the eye with um, what's called OCT. And you can see here's the cornea right here. And here's your lens. So what it does is it says, okay, well, here's the front part of the M&M. Here's the back part of the M&M. Let's leave a little safety zone in here. And this is the part we're going to soften up for you. Then we can also make image, uh, we can also take incisions. And we can make them whatever configuration we want. Well, why would you want to do that? Well, we talked about not needing sutures. And in most cases, we don't. But the incision is still a, a planar incision like this. But if you make an incision with a hinge, well, then maybe you don't need a, a, any kind of suture at all, and it becomes a st more structurally sound incision. There's some pluses and minuses to this, and not everyone do we do incisions on, but it is an option for us if we want. And, and they heal really, really nicely. One of the things that we're pioneers at at UCI is using lasers for corneal transplants. We have the largest series of, of patients who have corneal transplants done with a laser. And we know in those patients that using the laser means faster visual recovery, less astigmatism, a stronger wound. And so that's been translated here now to cataract surgery as well. So when you look at a capsulotomy, it's now a perfect circle as opposed to you know, close to a perfect circle. Now, does this have any clinical, result, uh, clinical um, impact? Maybe, maybe not. It depends on the lens. It depends on your eye. It depends on how well that lens centers, but it could. Uh, we're able to fragment that lens, like we talked about. So now you see this little waffle pattern in the lens. So instead of taking out one big rock of a cataract, you're taking out little pieces, which is um, easier to do and less energy. More precise incisions rather than using a handheld blade. The other thing is you don't get perforations then. So with, when you're able to image the cornea, we're able to image it within microns of accuracy. So then we're able to say, well, I want to be 90% depth there. You're not, gonna, you're not gonna perforate. Whereas if you have a blade, you're well, I think it looks that deep, and let me take the blade and set it to this, and, and you go ahead and you make your incision. And there are times where it perforates, and you have to put an incision, a suture in it, um, and, and that becomes a, a little bit of a, a longer recovery sometimes. And then you get these better incisions. So here's, here's an example of a video of a patient of mine who got laser. So here I am docking the eye. This is sped up a little bit in the interest of time. And you can see it's going to scan the eye here. And here's the front part of the cornea. Here's the lens. And it's, it's checking. It's rechecking. Here's the back side of the lens. We can see here it's telling me this is where I'm going to put my little circle for my M&M. Here's my incisions for, for the astigmatism. And here it goes. And now it's, it's treating the, um, it did the capsulotomy in less than a second. It's waffling up that cataract. It's going to put in my incisions for astigmatism. And this patient wants a multifocal lens. So this patient, in order to get a good outcome, I need to treat the astigmatism. And so I'm treating that on the cornea. Then I'm going to take this patient to the operating room. So instead of having to peel that thing off, now I just pull it out of the eye. It comes right out of the eye. And, and that waffling allows me to remove that cataract much more gently uh, with much less energy and much more efficiently. So you can see that coming out really, really quick. And this was a, a moderately dense cataract. This was not uh, a, a very um, a soft cataract. And here comes the artificial lens. They all come in different sort of shapes and, and um, with different arms on them or haptics. But this one, I don't know if you guys can see with the, with the light here, this one has little rings in it. And those little rings are what gives it that multifocality that allows you to see distance and near. So customizing your surgery. Well, how do we do that? Well, we have to determine your, your expectations and goals. So we do that through questionnaires and, and by a lot of discussion. Uh, lifestyle and activity preferences, uh, we talked to you about that. 
personality traits I think are, are very important. There's certain lenses that just don't mesh with certain personalities. And, uh, <laughs> and, and um, so we, we talk about that. Um, we look at your visual potential. Is there something in your eye that may impact your ability to get the outcome that you want? Some of our newer technology to look at the shape of the eye now gives us a, an image of the sort of the high definition vision part of your retina, which is called the macula. And we get, we get an image on that on every patient now. And if there's some, any abnormality there, we can screen that and say, hey, we need this other test to make sure that we're not putting you into a lens that may not function because you have a retinal condition. Well, I don't know why that keeps advancing. Um, determining the degree of astigmatism, we use multiple tests. We have what's called a biometer, we have topographers, and, and we look at it in multiple different ways. And if it doesn't make sense, we're not, we're not shy to say, hey, Mrs. Jones, we need to treat your astigmatism. We'll see you back in two months and we'll do it. Because by and large, cataract surgery is not emergent. It's elective. We do it when it's, it makes sense to do it for you. There's a few cases where we need to do it urgently, but by and large, it can be delayed by a few weeks or a few months in order to give you the outcome that you want. Account for the refractive age at your starting point, so different, different technologies for different age people, if you will. And then choose the best uh, option of lens and surgical technologies individualized to you. I think this is really important. I don't think there's one shoe that fits all here. I think it's important. What you would need is different than what you would need, is different than what you would need, is different than what I would need. And I think it's important to take all those considerations into play when you talk about cataract surgery. So uh, why Gavin Herbert Institute? Well, we're all board certified experienced surgeons, uh, nationally recognized. We all speak nationally, internationally, locally certainly. Uh, teach at national and international courses. I know Dr. Fried and I both teach advanced FACO courses at both the uh, American Academy of Ophthalmology and the American Society of Cataract and Refractive Surgery. That meeting's coming up in a couple weeks. We, tra we train the next generation of surgeons. So we're the, we're the guys who train the people who are gonna be opening up shop you know, next door um, next week in, in Orange County. Um, we have expertise in routine and complex cataract cases. So we get a lot of referrals from the community guys on cases that are sort of a little outside their comfort zone. And, and you know, we don't shy from those cases. We actually enjoy those cases. Now, do we enjoy the easy ones too? Yes. Uh, but the, but the, the, the hard ones are also exciting. Uh, and and we, we're, I think we're really good at choosing the right technology at the right time for the right patient. So uh, at, at Gavin Herbert, we have six current uh, cataract surgeons. We're getting one more. Uh, myself, Dr. Fareed, Dr. Matt Wade, Dr. Sanjay Kedar, and then we have two, uh, three glaucoma faculty that also do cataract surgery, uh, Dr. Mosea, Dr. Bott, and Dr. Lin, who will be joining us um, soon. And with that, uh, I think we have time for some questions. And uh, thank you very much. Great question. So the question is, if you have double vision naturally, um, because the eyes don't align and you not have prisms in your glasses, how does that fit into things? Well, if you need prisms in your glasses, you're going to be wearing glasses. So in those cases of patients who have double vision and their eyes don't align, I usually uh, recommend a monofocal lens. You're going to be wearing glasses anyways um, for the prism. So again, this is where tailoring to the right patient comes into play. Yes. Question. So, great question. The question was, if you have astigmatism, how do you know where to put the lens? Do you have a mark on the lens? And the answer is yes. Uh, so we, we do a couple things. Uh, I, I like to do sort of belt and suspenders. So we have these fancy technologies that will measure your eye on the table and tell me where the steep part of your axis is. So then the lenses do have marks on them that I can rotate to that position. But we also um, we, also have, we also sit you up in the preoperative room and, and mark you when you're sitting up. One thing to realize is people's eyes rotate when they lie down. 
and it rotates variably. Some people's rotate a little bit more, some people's rotate a little less. So we need reference images. Uh, again, our, our biometer takes a reference image of your eye prior to cataract surgery so that I can say that you know, your left eye rotated by 15 degrees, so I know to rotate my lens by that much when I'm putting it in your eye. That's correct. So, so the question is, where do we put our incision? It's at what's called the limbus, which is the, the, um, the, where the cornea meets the limbus. And, and that's called, a, it's a clear corneal incision. Uh, that's what most modern cataract surgery is, as opposed to incisions that are in the sclera that require a big tunnel into the eye. Okay. Yes. So the question is, if you uh, haven't had experience with monovision, which is one eye set for distance, one eye for near, why not just do it? Well, the problem is that takes a lot of brain adjustment, and it can really throw a patient who's used to having equal vision in both eyes, it can throw them off. Now, we can do mini monovision, which is one eye for distance and one eye for slight intermediate, which is a little bit easier to tolerate than full monovision. But certainly if a patient has had it in their contact lenses or has had that set but with LASIK in the past, we know the brain has adjusted to it. Sometimes yes, and sometimes no. Will the brain adjust to it? The brain does neuroadapt very nicely. But in some patients, it's tough, especially if you're used to having a dominant eye for distance and now it's set for near. It can be very frustrating. Multifocal lens. Multifocal lenses are great because you get distance in both eyes and you get near in both eyes. And it's the same, same lens in each eye? Similar lens, yes. We can, we can mix and match because there are different types of multifocal lenses in terms of where they set the near point. The distance on all of them is great, and then the near we can adjust. So sometimes I'll put one with near and distance in one, and maybe the second one I'll do intermediate and distance to give a much fuller range. So you can, you know, there's a lot of mixing and matching there as well. Yes. Yeah, so we, so if you, if we go back to that little grid, it used to be that we'd have to correct astigmatism with just incisions in the cornea. Now we have a, a lenses that correct for astigmatism and near and far at the same time. So uh, the technology has really evolved where you're getting a lot of, a lot of correction with the lens for presbyopia as well as the astigmatism at the same time. Sometimes we still have to use incisions in the cornea to fine tune that and it depends on the, on the um, amount of astigmatism that you have. I didn't repeat the question, the question was, um, can, can you have a lens that corrects for astigmatism and presbyopia at the same time, essentially, correct? Yes. And, 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 dis focal. and distance far, right. So presbyopia correcting the, are the distance far. The one thing is this, you know, most of these lenses are made for people who sort of fall within the bell curve. If you have really, really, if you're super nearsighted, like a minus 10 or a minus 12 or a minus 15, sometimes the lenses don't come, all the technology doesn't come out that far. Or if you're super farsighted, these lenses are, are best for people sort of sit in that sweet spot within a couple uh, standard deviations of normal. If you're way out there, then oftentimes it's not great to go with one of these technologies because the optics haven't been you know, sort of uh, perfected in those kinds of patients. Yes. So um, one thing I, let me, the question is, he has a macular tear or a macular hole sometimes. The macula is a central part of the retina that accounts for central viewing. So when it comes to cataract surgery, um, the macular tear is really, it, it'll be there. So I tell patients, you know, we'll do your cataract surgery, the total vision improves, but that central blind spot will remain. Now, you have to have a perfect eye, really, for these multifocal lenses. So in a patient who has a macular problem, whether it's macular degeneration or a macular hole, again, we'll jump and do that monofocal lens for those patients. Yes. Can 
Yeah, great question. So the question was, what's a secondary cataract? Uh, why does it happen? What the treatments are? And what the side effects are? So it's called a posterior capsular opacity. Opacity, and again, we talked about the M and M. Okay, and that shell. So during surgery, we make a hole in the front shell, we leave behind the back shell, because in the back part of the eye, there's this jelly called vitreous. And vitreous is, you know, mostly embryologic in, in its um, function, meaning it's, it's there to help the eye form. Uh, but other than that, it doesn't really help us all that much. And, and it gets in our way, it can cause uh, issues if you break that shell during surgery. So if you put a lens inside that bag, and now you've taken a big fat lens and put it, replaced it with a skinny lens. There's that skinny lens, then uh, skinny uh, lens there, and it gets shrunk wrapped by that shell. So when it shrink wraps, sometimes you get some wrinkles in that shell. Sometimes there's little microscopic parts of the cataract that get left behind, and they start to proliferate. They don't know that all their friends are gone. They they continue to proliferate, and then that those can grow across the back of that shell. And so um, those are really the major causes for the PCO. So then people come in and say, gosh, doc, you told me my cataract wasn't going to grow back, and it's back. And when we look at them, we can see this very fine sheen uh, behind the lens. The lens is crystal clear. So then we use a laser to ba basically make a hole in that shell to open it up. Now it's OK to break that shell, because now your lens is there to act as a barrier. Some of the side effects are uh, more Focus. floaters. And uh, there's a very small incidence of um, increased tear, uh, risk for retinal tears after that kind of procedure as well. But we, we follow you uh, throughout the um, post up here and give you precautions on that. So re-replacing the lens might not solve that problem? It will not solve that problem. It will not solve that problem. Yes. Okay, so great. So uh, some macular degeneration, a little bit of a wrinkle on the macula. Remember, the macula is the retinal. The, the exactly the wrinkle is a pucker. Epiretinal membrane is the actual term, correct term for it. It's uh, basically a little bit of a wrinkling of the central part of the retina, similar to a hole. We're not going to get rid of that with cataract surgery. And sometimes a macular pucker can cause a little bit of a wave or a distortion in the vision if it's significant. Yeah, the cataract surgery is in a completely different part of the eye. It's miles away from the retina. Right, so, right. I would, so in terms of lens choice, similar to this gentleman, we would avoid a multifocal lens because we want a perfect retina for a multifocal lens. So you, you, right, so you could, you could choose where you want it to be there, that's sort of personal. Depending on the amount of astigmatism, you still could do an astigmatism correcting lens, even with a retinal issue, glaucoma, uh, macular pucker, macular hole. It will still improve the overall quality of image. It just won't be as striking as if everything was proper. But it won't hurt you the same way that a multifocal lens could not necessarily hurt you, but you wouldn't get the same benefit of the lens with a multifocal lens um, as you would with a astigmatism correcting lens. So, so you're calling it an astigmatism correcting lens? So there's, so there's a monofocal lens, right? The toric lens is astigmatism correcting. Then there's presbyopia correcting, which is the multifocal, okay, which gives you distance and near. And then there's, a, there's presbyopia and astigmatism correcting lenses together. So there, there's, there's, there's all, it gets very jumbled. Yes. Um, one more question. In reading, you know, the nearsighted is here, and then you've got your driving, and then you've got your computer mm -hmm. distance, working on a computer, laptop, you know, whatever. So how does that So you have to... Right. So the question is, you want to read, you want to be on the computer, you want to have distance. How am I going to accomplish that with a monofocal lens? Well, you choose which of those distances you want to be not wearing your glasses for. Because everything else you're going to be wearing glasses for. So if you choose to have the distance be without glasses, then you will need glasses at the computer and reading, and vice versa. Okay, well, yeah. <laughs> yes.
are hearing you, you're more sounding like you, there are more choices than really that. But having said that, we also put in whether you can have acrylic or um, a silicone lens. And then, does the, um, I, and you said Johnson & Johnson, are there other companies yes. that make the lenses that maybe there isn't a halo that you store? Right, so the question was, She's been somewhere else, <laughs> and it's a long, it's a long question, so I'll, I hope to get it right. Um, I'm just joking. Uh, and so, you know, she was told somewhere that there's four different ways to go, distance, near, one eye distance, one eye near, or multifocal. Uh, and with respect to the, the um, is there different manufacturers of lenses, ones that may not have halo and glare? And the answer is, there is more than four choices. Uh, I think we've demonstrated that here today. Uh, there are, this is just an example. Johnson & Johnson is just the example I have. The Alcon makes lenses, Bausch & Lomb makes lenses, Zeiss makes lenses. There's all different types of lenses. They all have different characteristics to them. Uh, what you want is someone who's experienced with a particular platform and can get you through that and tell, can tell you, hey, this is the right platform for you or it's not. Luckily, we have, a, we have a, um, experience with the ma majority of the platforms out there. Do I have my favorites? Certainly. Uh, but I think that, you know, really the, uh, the, the, the choice of acrylic or silicone for you is not really a patient choice. I mean, I, I mean no offense. It's just it, it has to do with what the lens is going to deliver. There was a lens that used to be really popular that's still popular among some doctors um, called a crystal lens. Okay, it's made by Bosch and Lohmann. It's supposed to flex within the eye. How many people have heard of that lens? Florence Henderson, right? I mean, um, and so the, the, the part with that lens is it's great, and it, it's supposed to give you distance and near without the halo and glare. The problem is, from a practical perspective, it doesn't deliver the way it's supposed to. And so even though technologically it sounds great, practically it doesn't give that. So we don't use a lot of them because if I'm going to tell you you're going to see distance and near, I want to do the best job I can to give you that. Will I tell you that you might have some halo and glare? Yes. Could I put in a crystal lens in you and hope for the best? Yes. And have I used that in some patients after I've talked to them about all that? Yes. It really depends, again, on your individual case and what makes sense to you and what risks you're willing to take. Yeah, so usually when there's so many choices, you really need a doctor that's going to break it down and say, you know what, based on your lifestyle, based on what you enjoy doing, based on where you want to be spectacle-free, here are the two or three choices for you. Now, one thing I didn't mention that it's worth mentioning is pretty much any lens other than the monofocal lens is not covered by your insurance. There's an out-of-pocket cost for all of these things. Mm -hmm. Sounds like a big omission, and I apologize that I, I should have mentioned that <laughs> earlier. Uh, but I realize that we're talking about this here. Uh, so you have to understand that lenses that correct for astigmatism, lenses that give you distance and near, are upgrades to standard cataract surgery. It is truly modern cataract surgery, but the government and insurance payers they don't care whether you see well or not. They just care that the cataract's there. And it's true. That's why we have different health insurance and we have different vision insurance. And so uh, these technologies, unfortunately, are not covered by insurance. Um, but, you know, if you, if you came in, we could talk to you about that. Mr. Williams. Uh, in the video, the eye is moving. Yeah. And, and then you're talking about uh, lasers that are dealing in microns yeah. and whatnot. And so I'm Great question. So the question was. And then I have a spooky question. Okay. <laughs> if, if the patient's awake, uh -huh. what do you see? Good questions. Okay. So uh, the, the first question was how do you keep the eye still during the laser? Uh, during the laser, there's the initial part, there's a docking where there's actually a little suction cup that comes in and, 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 and holds the eye in place. It's painless. Uh, and you fill that reservoir with water and then the, the, the laser comes in. So it's a liquid docking. So there's actually nothing, nothing pushing on the cornea. And your eye is locked and your, into and your place. And your eye is stable. During the cataract surgery, if your eye moves a little bit, we move with you. Okay, so it's a little bit of a dance. Um, with respect to uh, the spooky question, which is, as a patient, what do you see? Having not had cataract surgery myself, I can tell you what my patients tell me is they feel like it's a little psychedelic. They feel like it's a little bit of a light show. They see different colors, different lights, and you know things are a little dim up front because their cataracts in place, and then things are bright at the end of the case. I don't know if you and the IV it. sedation makes it very psychedelic. Yeah, yeah. So, so. <laughs> that's right. Yes. Um, I was uh, diagnosed with hemophilia, and I was told 
Yeah, great question. So the question is narrow angle glaucoma or narrow angle anatomic narrow angle. And I see Dr. Garg is going to pull the picture up for me. So this is great. Narrow angle, the angle of the eye that we're referring to when we say that is the angle that drains the fluid from inside the eye. This is not the tear film, but the fluid that's inside the eye. If that angle gets narrow and the outflow of the fluid is diminished, the pressure in the eye goes up and you get optic nerve damage or glaucoma. When the cataract, and you can see, show, show them where the angle is. Okay, so when the cataract gets bigger, that lens is getting fatter, it's pushing the iris forward and narrowing the angle even more. So if you have, you start with narrow angles and now your cataract is starting to get fatter, the cataract might not be visually significant, but it's starting to become significant from the standpoint of risk for glaucoma. So sometimes in patients who still see 20-20 and their vision is fine, I may still say, yeah, but I think we need, it's time to take out this cataract or the lens so we can open that angle. Cataract surgery is a cure for narrow angles because the angle opens way up after that. Right, so uh, the question was, I had a corneal transplant six years ago, uh, and I've been on steroid drops, so my cataract is, is coming on, I'm gonna need that done. And the second comment was, even after a cornea, my vision's poor. So you have to understand that when you look at the optics of the eye, you can have a clear cornea, but if that cornea is irregular, the shape is irregular, even with glasses, you may not get good vision. What you need to try is a contact lens. And if you get a contact lens, now you may say, I can't fit a contact lens, but just for the, for the sake of argument, if you get a contact lens and your vision's good, well, then we know that at least it's clear now and you can see through the contact lens. What happens oftentimes is that depending on how old you were when you had your corneal transplant, your cataract was already sort of there and you've been waiting on your cornea to clear up. But really, if you don't address the cataract, then it's hard to get a clear image because now you're trying to look through a cloudy lens and even though your, lens, your, your cornea may be clear, it may not be perfect, but you may need a contact lens to fix your cornea and a cataract surgery to fix your, your lens. In the setting of a corneal transplant, you have to be extra careful because those cells on the backside of the cornea that can get damaged are even more delicate because of, the, of you having had a transplant. So whoever your cataract surgeon is should get a, a scan of the back of those cells. It's called an endothelial cell count to look at the quality of those cells so they, at least they can talk to you about your chances of coming out of the surgery without needing more surgery. So I often recommend laser cataract surgery if you've had a cornea yeah. transplant because the laser softens the cataract, you don't need as much energy and so those cells do a little bit better when you've had a cornea transplant. Yeah. I have a scleral lens that actually, right. that I have pretty good side, I have yeah. three different pairs of glasses. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Sure. But so with, with the scleral lens you see well. That's good. So yeah, that, that's good. I mean, so corneal surgery, unfortunately, is not like cataract surgery. It's, it's not quite as predictable. There's, there's too many variables. So uh, I would say they still did a good job. If you have good vision with a scleral lens, you know, to get uncorrected vision after a corneal transplant is not the norm. We always talk about best corrected vision after a corneal transplant. Yes. A pinguiculum or a pterygium? Okay, so the question is, do you take a pinguiculum off before cataract surgery? So let's talk about what is a pinguiculum, what is a pterygium. A pinguiculum is a, uh, they're actually the same thing. Um, and they're, it's a degeneration of the conjunctiva of the eye. The conjunctiva is the mucous membrane on the surface of the eye over the sclera, over the white of the eye. That can degenerate with years of sun ultraviolet radiation, and you can develop a little yellowing or a little elevation of that tissue that we call pinguiculi. And if that tissue grows onto the cornea, then we call it a pterygium. So in general, if the pinguiculum is there and it's not bothering the patient, we leave it alone because it doesn't really cause any visual issues. If it grows onto the cornea now, it can cause astigmatism. It can cause irregular tugging of the cornea and astigmatism. In those cases, often we'll remove the pterygium before the cataract surgery or at the same time, depending on what we're going for. 
Um, let me, maybe we should, let's answer anyone who hasn't asked a question yet, and then we'll come back for round two. Okay, yes. So uh, the question was, if you have a multifocal lens, and I'm going to expand it to extended depth of focus lens, what are the chances that you won't need glasses? It's, it's sort of individual on what you do day to day, but generally we try to, you know, promise or, or try, to, try to strive for being out of your glasses for 80 to 90% of your day. So just say you're going to sit and read for hours and hours and hours, you may want to throw on a pair of cheaters. Just say you're going to drive late at night, you're driving to Las Vegas or something, you may want a pair of glasses just to tighten up the vision just a little bit. But the, the goal of a multifocal lens is for sort of casual vision throughout your day. You know, you're driving to the market, you look at a, a price tag, you go to a restaurant, you know, you read your phone. For those activities, you're not doing this all day long. And that's, that's the real goal there. But if you're going to sit and really focus on something, then, then you may want a pair of glasses to, to help with that. Now, the nice thing is for the majority of people, a pair of glasses will help you sh sharpen up the vision so that you know, it, it uh, makes the vision very, very good. Very good. Yes. Great question. So he, so you've had a toric lens, and they didn't have a multifocal toric at that point. So can you go back? We usually, if the lens is well positioned and you're having good vision, we don't recommend going back into the eye. We do sometimes do lens exchanges, but it's usually for a mechanical complication. The lens is out of position, or the the power is so off that it's really not physiologically uh, compatible. In those cases, we'll do lens exchanges. But if you're okay, leave it alone. Yeah. Yeah, so the reason to leave it alone is anytime you go, there, what happens after you go into an eye is you get that scarring. You, we talked about the, the leaflets coming down. And so now you're trying to dissect open a membrane that used to be flexible, that is now fibrose down, that's a few microns thick. So if you try to open that up and it doesn't, then you could have trouble removing the lens, having jelly coming out of the eye, ending up worse off than it had if you didn't do anything. And the other thing is to put a toric lens in and a, a multifocal toric lens, you need it to not only orient, like we talked about with the marks uh, that was astutely brought up, but then also to center properly in the bag because you need that to center so that the line of sight is through the center of that lens. And if there's any scarring in the periphery of that capsule, it may not center where you want it to and then, then you're going to feel like, gosh, I'm, I wish I hadn't done that. Interestingly, there's some technology that's in the works that may allow. change that and allow us to go back in in an easier fashion. The other question is a lot of patients say, okay, I'm going to get the multifocal. I'm a little nervous. What if I absolutely hate it? We can take it out. So within the first year, certainly, even maybe two years, if you absolutely hate a multifocal lens, we can remove it. It's rare because the multifocals are so good now, and we do a good job of talking to patients and making sure we give you the right lens. But in those situations, rare situations where somebody can't tolerate, for example, the halos or whatever it is, it is uh, we can take them out and exchange them. And this is going to be the last question, so you'll have a chance to visit with the audience after. Okay. Perfect. So last question. Yes, sir, you've been very... Um, so on The, so, so bi. Okay. So the question was, with a with a multifocal lens, is it a bifocal? Is it a trifocal? Is it you know, is it a progressive? And the answer is sort of. Okay. I mean, uh, so the, the reason I say that is with the, with the multifocals, we talk, I talked about the the defocus curve. It depends on you know, with your distance peak he, being here, it depends on where the near peak is. Is it a little closer or is it a little further away? So it depends on what that lens is going to give you. Uh, and depends on if you know how you how it gets set into your eye. Do we plan on pushing you a little bit for a distance? Do we we have different th parameters we can play with? But essentially, a multifocal lens gives you two focal points, and the extended depth of focus is sort of that um, longer defocus. Uh, extended range. No. No. Your brain just gets it like that. Yeah. Perfect. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.